Well, hello and welcome to another episode of MMT Ed Q&A. Thanks for joining us and thanks to all of those who keep submitting questions. We're trying to get to them as best we can. Now tonight, my special guest is Dr. Pavlina Cheneva from Bard College in the United States. And she writes a lot about the job guarantee. And she has a new book out at the moment. It's an excellent read. And I recommend you get hold of it to explore the wonderful world of job guarantee. Now, earlier today, I pre-recorded a conversation with Pavlina. We explored three main issues. One relating to job guarantee and UBI. Yep. And another relating to the central role of a job guarantee in MMT, and that's quite often misunderstood. And finally, we got on to discussing the role of the job guarantee in countries like Indonesia. And we're going to spread these topics over three episodes to keep each episode nice and tight. This is what happened today. Hope you enjoy it. Well, hi, Pavlina. Thanks for joining us. Um, great to have you. And uh, we've got some questions. And congratulations on your new book. It's a wonderful book and a great contribution to the, the literature on job guarantee. And uh, I hope it does really well. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Bill. It's good to be with you. The uh, first question is from Dan. Uh, and he asks, how is a job guarantee better than universal basic income? Wow, a good question to start with. A good question and potentially long answer. But, you know, I, I think it's important to start with some of the theoretical contributions of uh, MMT because there is a lot of discussion of how one program is better than the other or the other has other benefits that the first doesn't. But there is really a missing piece in the UBI literature, and that is... Um, misunderstanding the purpose of the tax, the tax force behind the currency. So, you know, in MMT, we say that taxes drive demand for the government issued currency. And essentially, it creates, uh, yeah, it creates demand for those who don't have it. Now, when you have UBI and you provide the currency, so to speak, for free, you invalidate the very purpose of the taxes that were initially imposed to create demand for the currency. And this has deep implications for the macroeconomic functioning of these programs, um, how, um, what the UBI might do to the value of the currency and on and on. So this, this component I haven't really seen almost anywhere in the UBI literature being addressed. And so uh, the way to think about this is that the UBI as a, as a policy motivates itself by tax and spend logic, which is backwards. Uh, in other words, UBI folks are saying you have to tax carbon taxes, the wealthy, uh, financial transactions, oil extraction, you name it, right? There's a slew of tax mechanisms to fund UBI. And as MMT describes, you actually don't tax to spend at the federal level. Programs are funded through the public purse and the sovereign power. So what is the problem with this logic? Well, the problem is that first, the existence of those policies then are dependent on these extractive policies, or the neoliberal kind of economic toolkit. So what we need to do with MMT is cut the umbilical cord and escape this tax and fund logic because we are essentially dependent on Wall Street, right? And on pillaging the environment to fund anti-poverty programs. So that's number one. Number two is that just as a policy proposal, UBI is not even counter-cyclical proposal. You know, UBI is provided to all rain or shine, irrespective of labor market status, of income. And so it is a one large contribution to the non-government sector that does not offer the kind of stabilization feature that the job guarantee would provide. As we have discussed, it, it would be an automatic stabilizer. It would rise in 
times of crises when mass unemployment evolves, and then it will shrink as the private economy recovers. So it does not have this counter-cyclical feature. Now, some more enlightened UBI commentators would say, well, look, you can actually use the tax component to do a counter-cyclical policy, but it's not UBI that's counter-cyclical. You're actually attempting to design a counter-cyclical tax policy. It's yeah. not a benefit of UBI. Yeah. And again, once again, it's very difficult to use taxes to adjust them counter-cyclically. I mean, I think we have to grapple with that very seriously. So um, on, on many levels at the macroeconomic level, UBI really fails to deliver. And then there is also the political economy of UBI that I think is important. You know, it is, it, there's a little lure to its simplicity that, oh, how wonderful it would be just to provide income to people. And surely we understand that income helps. But um, it's often used as a way to displace existing fiscal uh, policies that have been targeted, crafted over many years carefully for particular aspects of economic insecurity. And we don't want to have a system that displaces these. Now, what the job guarantee says is that there is one aspect of economic insecurity that has not been provided for, and that is the absence of a job. So UBI, with all of its good intentions, still is predicated on a system of mass unemployment. Yeah. And we know these experiments where UBI uh, folk, or mini experiments, you, people who receive basic income, it's not exactly UBI, still look for work, but um, the work is not there. Apart from the fact that it could be a kind of a Trojan horse to displace important public policies, doesn't really provide this kind of freedom, if you will. It doesn't uh, address the problem of unemployment, and importantly, it doesn't address the, the costs of unemployment the large social costs of unemployment. And we know, we know quite a lot about this, that income is just one aspect of the problem of unemployment. The costs actually tend to be uh, largely non-pecuniary. Just to reflect on that, the surrender, I call it a surrender to the idea that the government can't create jobs. And so if you, it's almost a, this sort of, it's, it's a surrender to this neoliberal idea that the jobs are, uh, are what they are, and uh, the government can't do anything about that. So to solve the poverty problem of unemployment, you just give someone a dollop of income and convert them sort of into a consumption unit that ignore all of the other social aspects of work and you know self-esteem and all of those network type things and just give people enough to survive so they become consumption units. And I think that's a really impoverished concept of humanity and work and uh yes i think that i mean we all work i think part of the um concern is that work has become punitive precarious so we share that diagnosis of the labor market but just as you point out what the job guarantee attempts to do is establish an unambiguous standard for minimum uh sustaining family sustaining job and that we don't really have a macroeconomic policy or structural policy that fortifies uh, the floor. And UBI you know, attempts to provide an opt-out for people to leave their bad jobs, quote unquote, but it doesn't really provide an opt-in into a good job if you're looking for one. And again, if we are assuming that the only thing you need is income, Again, we're seeing the person as, as you say, as a consumption unit, who can be exploited as a consumption unit. Slumlords can extract the basic income in the form of higher rent. You know, healthcare costs may skyrocket, but so long as you have the basic income, the assumption is you should be okay. It's a subsidy to firms. Why should a firm pay a living wage if the government has so-called promised a living wage? So it is, I, I do see it as a surrender to the broken economic model and not a real structural reform, where the job guarantee has some very specific contributions and it, it really flips the paradigm. As you have argued in your own work, it is a replacement for the Nairu. I mean, what we know in the universe of all policies available to us 
we know that however well intended they may, they may be or how well meaning they may be, unless the right to work isn't guaranteed, the stabilizer will always be unemployment. Yeah. And so we either have guaranteed unemployment, a world of guaranteed unemployment, which is the world we live in today, or we have a world of guaranteed employment. And we no longer use the Nairu as this gold star for failure, right? You know, you know, policymakers say, oh, well, we've reached the Nairu. It's still millions of people are out of work, but the, you know, we congratulate ourselves for reaching finally full employment, leaving many, many out of work. And so, so what the job guarantee does, it really drives the stake through this unemployment stabilizer in yeah. uh, the macroeconomy. And so the MMT perspective also says that if you are the issuer of the currency, you are responsible for providing it in a manner that ensures full employment and price stability. And currently, we don't, we don't do this. Okay, that's it for tonight. Thanks very much for joining us. We'll be back next week with more questions and hopefully some more interesting answers. In closing, I just want to thank all of those who have made donations to MMT Ed so far. We really appreciate that and thank you. MMT Ed relies on public donations to build our capacity and to get us in a position where we can offer courses free of charge to the general public. We hope to start floating courses in September of this year. So if you can help, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Until next week, see you later.